Good morning. My name is John Richards. I am a technical product manager at VMware. I work on the AirWatch side of things. I've been here or there for about four and a half years. I actually started in the enterprise in the uh, engineering side of things. I started on the testing iOS, MDM, iOS profiles, DEP, a little bit of EPP, and then just over the past two years, I switched to the Mac side of things, and. Um, and then uh, about a year and a half ago, I switched to the product manager side of things um, because Mac has been something that's been really interesting to me. It's been growing a ton in the enterprise space. And so um, it's been really exciting to be a part of you know, building the product out. Um, I am on Slack. You might recognize my Hobbs avatar. It's my favorite comic growing up. So my name is JR. I have a Twitter that I'm not really good at using. I need to <laughs> continue to get better at. Um, but that is my handle. Uh, if you want to tweet at me, I'll check it every few days or so. Um, so let's get started. As we've seen today, uh, or sorry, this whole week, WWDC last uh, month, our world's changing underneath our feet, right? Um, imaging is dying. Um, you've got all these new MD MDM workflows that need to be you know, being used. Apple is talking about this golden path of MDM. Um, but it's not just the platform that's changing, it's also our workforce that's changing. Our users are becoming more mobile than ever. They want to work from Starbucks, they want to work from home. Maybe they want to use an iPad Pro, or maybe they want to use a PC. Um, maybe they want to you know, do a lot of work from their iPhone. So having that mix of you know, access to resources, the identity management, also in a way that's secure that allows them to uh, branch outside their corporate printer is really important. And so something that we've noticed in the um, industry just over the past year and a half is this huge um, movement towards user experience. So um, having this you know, clean user experience that gives a lot of transparency to the user, lets them know what's going on on the device when management's being applied, um, gives them that feeling that it's not Big Brother watching them, uh, Big Brother trying to lock them down and, and restrict them from doing their work. Um, because if, if they have that, that sense of feeling that they're being watched and and they're being you know, super managed, then they might not be so productive. They might want to try to circumvent those tools, remove them off the device, and that's not good from a security perspective, of course. So um, there's been a trend in um, you know, designing these kind of custom DEP workflows or custom enrollment workflows, Splash Buddy, DEP Notify. Some of you might be familiar with that. Those have been really awesome in helping people bridge the gap so far. Um, but you know, even, even while going through this process of designing these workflows, um, like I said, the platform is changing under, underneath our feet, and something like this happens. Right? So that kind of throws a wrench in everything, and have to take a step back and, and, and evaluate how we're, how we're designing these workflows and how we're designing the architecture of our management so that um, you know, things like this can um, you know, seamlessly go through. So um, MDM has been, um, you know, been around for many years now. It, it shipped with, I believe, iOS 4 in 2011. Um, but on the macOS side, it's been kind of slowly being iterated over time. In 2011, they added a few commands, um, you know, secur security-related um, VPN and, um, sorry, a device wipe and, and locking the device, but that wasn't enough for people to, you know, start pushing enrollment profile. So Apple's been iterating over time. They added DP and VPP in 2013, and that was something that was really heavily used in the iOS space, not as much in the Mac space. Um, they added the ability to do package installation, which um, you know, a lot of vendors started using to push out their own agents, but um, not many, nobody really had it extended for any additional apps. Um, and then they started adding kind of some more OS level features like account creation, OS update management, et cetera. Um, but it wasn't until uh, last year with APFS that things really started to get interesting, right? And I APFS brought a lot of great things like performance enhancements, security enhancements, um, but it, 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 the main thing I think affects a lot of people in this room today is that we would find out that imaging is going to be really challenging. Um, it's not necessarily impossible, but you know, getting firmware on the device and, and being able to image it afterwards, is, it's not something that's very easy. And uh, with the T2 chip in the devices now, it's, it's, it's becoming extremely hard, if not impossible. Um, and then at the same time, if you did have an MDM, maybe you had to deal with something user-approved MDM, user kernel extension loading. Um, so all of this is is really changing quickly um, just in the past year. And so uh, what's important is that you have to really kind of rethink the way that you're doing things in this modern management paradigm. Um, and that applies to you know, the deployment, the provisioning devices, how you're getting them out to your users, how you're configuring them and pushing down these apps, and then also having that layer of identity and access management so that they're secure. And as they move outside of our corporate perimeter, um, you have that kind of security baseline in place. So 
uh, to reiterate that MD it's important that MDM is going to need to be in the core of everything you're doing, right? That's going to need to be the baseline of uh, the devices to attest to make sure that it's secure. And then anything that MDM is not good at or you don't like the way it's doing, it doesn't fit inside your workflow right now, that's where you would add these layered services like Chef or Puppet, OS Query, Monkey, et cetera, and then the identity and access management on top of it. Um, so I wanted to stop there real quick. You, you guys know that I'm from VMware. Um, you maybe you know, probably have heard of AirWatch. Maybe you've heard of Workspace ONE, but it might not be clear exactly you know, how we fit into the picture. Um, VMware has been you know, been around for years in the virtualization space, but it wasn't until recently we got into the kind of the end-user computing side of things, um, you know, IT management, that stuff. So I wanted to go over exactly uh, what our current product suite is to give you an overview. Um, so the Workspace ONE platform is comprised of all of these different VMware products. So when it comes to um, the uh, Horizon side of things, that's for virtualizing apps and instances, and that's something we've had around for a while. Um, AirWatch was acquired about four years ago, four and a half years ago, and that's where it comes into the deployment, provisioning, and configuration app side of things. We also have an identity manager called VIDM. It is an identity provider if you want it to be, although most people have their own identity providers, and, and so you can federate access through that. Um, we do have a tight integration with Ping, and then at Octane, you might have heard last month, they announced uh, an integration as well. So. Um, over the next few months, we're going to be tightening integration with Okta to help provide uh, the level of conditional access and, and stuff that Okta provides. And then something we announced at VMworld last year was uh, Workspace ONE Intelligence. And this is something that's really cool. It's a cloud-based analytics reporting automation engine that essentially uh, takes all the data points from Horizon, from AirWatch, from Identity Man Manager into one central source and allows you to create um, contextual actions and, and decisions based on those. Um, so in addition to the automation that it provides, um, they've got some really rich reporting and dashboard um, that can help you, you know, really get insights into anything you want. Um, I know one of the demos was uh, for WannaCry, you know, tracking the, the patching of those machines and, and making sure that the rollout's going out smoothly. Um, so that's something that we're really excited about that, um, you know, kind of help bring this um, rich reporting and almost an if this then that kind of workflow to management. Um, and it's all tying in from MDM. So all of this comprised is the Workspace ONE platform. So you're going to start hearing Workspace ONE more than AirWatch um, going forward and, and definitely in marketing. Um, but it's important to know that the AirWatch is, is, is that core MDM, and then everything else is Workspace ONE. Um, but when we were talking about AirWatch in particular, this is kind of the high-level architecture. MDM is in our core. We started with iOS MDM. That was kind of one, one of the very first things that AirWatch was started on. So Implementing the MDM protocol uh, for iOS, it, it made it really easy to you know, start extending that to macOS. So uh, we support um, probably 95% now of what macOS MDM can do today. We support um, per user MDM, also allow you to do per user MDM if you're on the, you know, using, still using network users, um, you can do that. So what's important to note is um, it doesn't require the agent to be managed. MDM is first, and then you add the agent on top if you want to add the extra capabilities that we provide in the agent. And then if you also, we have, uh, we have a VMware tunnel. Uh, this is a per app VPN tunnel that uh, we've had for a few years now. It was mainly used for tunneling Safari, but as we all know, most people are not using Safari as their primary browser, um, although it's getting a lot better these days. But um, Firefox, Chrome, et cetera, those couldn't be tunneled. So just in the past two months, I think two and a half months, we released a new version of VMware Tunnel that allows you to do per app tunneling on any third-party app. Um, so that's something that's been really cool. We've been seeing some cool use cases like a tunneling terminal or, or remote desktop without having to have that full device you know, VPN on top. And so, um, but even then, if you, if you don't like you know, how the, our agent's doing things or it doesn't provide enough flexibility for you, um, if you need more than that, that's where you would add these you know, additional layered services like Chef, Puppet, OS Query, Nomad, et cetera. Um, so we've, we're trying to design this architecture in a way that you know, MDM is always going to be our rock solid base. We'll add extra functionality to the agent on top. We'll have our uh, VPN tunnel. And then anything else you want to add can be easily extended. Um, but if we're thinking about this modern paradigm of management, moving from imaging, it's, it, it, it always comes back to this golden path that Apple's been preaching for a while, and that's through DP. 
And it's not exactly easy to go through DP yet. Um, you have to buy a lot of new devices. And, and so I think now as everybody's starting to refresh their hardware, we're seeing more and more adoption in DP. Um, so if, I think everybody's familiar with DP, but, but if you're not, um, it provides some really cool stuff like streamline enrollment, allows you to customize setup system out of the box, skip a lot of the screens you know, to help guide the end user to management. There's also something that Apple implemented a few years ago called await configuration. Um, this is something that's cool that allows you to push down apps and policies during Setup Assistant, hold the user in that state until the MDM server says, okay, you're all good, and allows them to go through. Um, and one interesting use case out of that that I, I think was one of the original reasons that this was implemented um, was for the passcode profile. So if you're imagining on an iOS device, uh, you have the passcode Setup Assistant screen, you, you put in your PIN code, but then the experience before this came out was you get out of Setup, setup Assistant, the passcode profile comes down, you get a pop-up, you need to change your passcode again. So within one minute, you've set a passcode twice. It wasn't a great experience. Um, so weight configuration was added to uh, solve one of the, that problem for in particular, so to allow passcode profile to be applied during setup assistant, and then once it got to the passcode screen, the complexity rules would already be applied. Um, so this is something that, it, that has been extended to even more policies, um, and then also something that we recently added called Bootstrap Package that I know a lot of people have been excited about. Um, a lot of people also call it custom DP. And so during the away configuration phase, we've also added the ability to send down the install, play, install application command during this time. So that allows you to start kind of thinking about moving off your imaging workflows. Some of those critical tools that you might put in your image, those would be delivered during this time. Um, and so to give you an idea of what this command is, this is something that uh, we've been using and other vendors have been using for a long time to push down our own agent. And the idea is that our agent would then install the rest of your packages. But um, it, it was actually one of y'all that came to us and said, hey, this command can be used for a lot more than just your agent. So what if we changed it a little bit to allow us to push down any arbitrary package, right? And so this is something that has really unlocked a lot of different use cases. The idea of a package being installed during Setup Assistant before even getting to the login window has unlocked a lot of different um, you know, use cases and, and workflows. And we wanted to extend it a little bit further than that because speed is you know, utmost priority, getting these packages installed as fast as possible. So we added CDN integration on top of that. Um, so no matter where the device is, it's gonna be getting that package from the closest server. Um, now there are a few caveats with this command. It is, um, it's, not, it's not robust enough yet for using large packages like Office or Adobe Suite. Um, when you push down the command, the feedback is command acknowledge or command refuse. That's about it. Um, so it's not really good for pushing down these large apps where you want to have downloaded and installed progress. Maybe you have some additional actions that need to happen after that and you want some rich feedback. Um, so that's something that we recommend. It's only for those critical tools like Monkey, Chef, um, maybe your, your antivirus, et cetera. Um, but there's also another caveat in that sending multiple packages is a little bit unreliable right now. Um, now, that being said, in 10.13.6, and I think some of the betas, there, there's been some improvements around this command. Um, and you know, it, it seems like there's, there's a lot more development happening. So I'm expecting to see this kind of tighten up. But in the meantime, Eric Gomez came to the rescue. And he added uh, a tool called install applications. Not too confusing. Um, but that, that is a, a single package that runs a script that then pulls down all of his packages and installs them. Um, and so that's been a great solution. That's going to help people bridge that, that current gap with the command. Um, and so with this, with this command, we knew that it was really powerful, yet also simple. But we wanted to make sure that we understood as much as possible how it worked, uh, all the different use cases that, that could be used with it, and all the caveats so that you know up front what you're dealing with when you're using this command. So um, I have a lot of uh, really rich documentation, super technical documentation on code.vmware. Um, just search for bootstrap package, and you'll find um, a lot of documentation about that. And that's actually replicated on GitHub as well. But bootstrap package and, and installing things during Setup Assistant, um, that's not everything, right? You, you still need the rest of the apps. And so um, about a year and a half ago, we started doing um, a deep look into our current software management framework. And we, we've been hearing, we were hearing a lot of feedback about the different gaps with that. It wasn't really reliable. It wasn't robust enough for people's needs. Um, and so we were kind of going back and forth on whether we needed to fix uh, or improve the existing implementation or, or do something else. And so started talking to a lot of people in the community, uh, not just our customers, um, just trying to figure out what they're using today to deploy their applications. And the same 
same tool kept coming up over and over and over again. And that was Monkey. Um, so we made the decision, internal decision, to start using Monkey as our software management framework. And I know that's kind of generated a lot of buzz lately. So I um, wanted to kind of go into that. that. This is something that we have the first version out. It's available in AirWatch 9.3. Um, so we're, we're continuing to iterate on that. And so um, to give you a little bit more information about what we're doing, I wanted to go into a little bit more of a deep dive. So this is our architecture with Monkey on the client side. With uh, our AirWatch agent, we have shipped a forked version of Monkey. Um, that is actually, uh, you know, we wanted to make sure that uh, we, we kept the power of Monkey, we didn't modify it too much, and allowed it to remain as powerful as it is, um, but extending the functionality uh, within DM and our agent. So uh, we have a Monkey controller within the AirWatch daemon that is essentially um, setting up the, the catalogs and manifests locally. Um, it's downloading the package, whether from the AirWatch server or the CDN, and then it's just running a managed software update, and, and Monkey takes care of the rest. Um, so that's something that's been working really well for us, and uh, some of the roadmap items we have are, you know, adding an auto package processor, um, optional installs, blocking applications, etc. Um, so another little caveat about Monkey: uh, we're currently on 3.3. We just updated that to 3.3. We started on 3.03 last year, and that's what we had for pretty much a whole year. Um, but we realized that Monkey is turning over really fast. There's a lot of new features that are being added, bug fixes, etc. So we're now treating it kind of as an open source library such as OpenSSL, and we're gonna be uh, really mindful about that in our uh, future releases to make sure that we're keeping up with Monkey. Um, another caveat is all of our applications are currently treated as managed installs. Um, so it, I know that right now a lot of people are using you know, unattended install or um, you know, all, all the other different modes, but right now uh, everything's a managed install. It's been, it's been working pretty well for us so far, but you know, we're definitely open to you know, improving that. But the first thing we wanted to focus on was the package info keys. Um, our existing solution wasn't robust enough, especially for pre and post install scripts, verifying certain actions after the installation happened, and then uninstall scripts. So that was the first um, piece that we wanted to focus on, and then we added the restart actions. And then I know uh, Monkey has you know, a lot more additional level of scoping with conditions, so we have a freeform text box that allows you to extend that. And then the other portion of Monkey that everybody loves is Managed Software Center. And um, so that was something we, we pivoted a little bit, and we're using something that we call the Workspace One native app. Um, so I'll go into that a little bit in a little bit, but this is a, an application that we have on all of our platforms. And so um, we, we wanted to have this uh, you know, unified experience so that if a user's using an iPhone or if they're using a PC or they're using the Mac, the catalog they were that they're looking at is showing the exact same resources uh, across their devices. So I wanted to go into a little bit of a demo real quick. I have a video of the console configuration. Oops. Why isn't it playing? Sorry, one second. I'm trying to figure out how to start the video. <laughs> Anybody know how to start it in presenter mode? <laughs> Sorry, one second. You're a mess. <laughs> 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 uh. I don't know. It's like my video has disappeared. All right, well, that's uh, <laughs> audible. That wasn't expecting. So uh, I'll walk through what it should be. Um, th this section that's showing here is the central. Oh, it's playing now. Perfect. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, all planned. 
So this section that I'm uploading the app to is where all of the different platforms also upload their apps. Um, if you've ever used AirWatch before, you would upload apps in a completely different section of the console. It's really confusing to know where to go depending on what platform you're doing. Um, so now we've unified the location of the console where you can upload this application. So when you start by uploading, say, a uh, .pkg, we will um, discover what type of package that is and then um, you know, send you on your way on the Mac flow. So, but it's, it's not just the, the package that's important, especially for Monkey. It's this package info file, and that has all the metadata about the package, you know, the extra actions that needs to take, um, the, the things it needs to check for before it installs the app. Um, so we wanted to, uh, you know, kind of abstract out what Monkey's doing and, and give the option for someone who isn't maybe familiar with Monkey, they don't know exactly how to generate the package info file. Um, so we created this uh, GUI wrapper tool called the VMware AirWatch Admin Assistant. And so this is essentially just a wrapper for monkey import. Drag the package in, or the, or the, the, the dot app, the DMG, et cetera, and then it will generate that um, package info that you can then use to upload to the console. And um, what's important about this is it is a default you know, vanilla monkey import. So if there's things in the console um, that aren't supported yet, you can still add those to the package info, and those will get sent down to the device, and monkey will process them. So once you have the package info, the icon, et cetera, you'll upload those to the console. And uh, from then, the, the console is parsing this, this plist and showing you everything that's currently in it. And anything, any modifications you want to make on top of that, those just get re reinserted back. So uh, in this first version in the UI, you can upload the, the icon. And then these are um, the various scripts that you can set, post, post, pre and post install scripts, uninstall scripts, verification scripts, et cetera. And then um, the restart actions and the conditions are also here. I know it's a little small. Um, but this is kind of a, this GUI view that we're trying to create of the monkey configuration to make it a little bit easier that you don't have to fiddle with plists all the time. So as we continue to iterate, we're going to be adding more and more of those package info keys to the GUI. So once you um, set the assignment of this app, um, you can decide to deploy it as soon as the device enrolls or on demand at your choosing. Um, you set your smart group. There's also some reporting and um, analytics that are within the console itself. When you search for the application and, and click inside of, it, inside of it, you can see, um, you know, once, once it's been deployed, you can kind of see the install status, um, errors, and et cetera, and that's all in this kind of dashboard view. So on to the client side, you know, it's, it's more than just the native apps that are important. We've got SaaS apps, um, you know, internal websites, um, maybe you have some virtual apps that are you know, PC only and you, you uh, can't run those on the Mac. App Store apps, if you use one of the few VPP apps that are, that are useful right now in enterprise. Um, and then you've got your native apps. So what was important um, as part of this first version is we wanted to create a catalog that brought all of those together. And so that's where this, this Workspace ONE native app came from. Um, so uh, what's important about this is uh, this is the central catalog that you'll use for everything on any device, and it's the same experience. So I wanted to show you that. Hopefully the video starts this time. All right, good. So you open the catalog. It loads you know, all of the apps and resources that you have available to you. It's using the MDM profile and certificates that's pushed down to you know, do that single sign-on. Um, so for example, let's say you have Dropbox. It's a SaaS app um, that you have configured. Using the identity manager, you can single sign on these users uh, directly from the catalog. And so that's something that's been really, really nice for people um, to have that seamless experience. Or if you have, say, uh, an intranet website, using VMware Tunnel, it can directly tunnel just to that website, and um, there's no other uh, you know, access or authentication required. Or if you have something like Visio, it can only run on a PC, we will leverage VMware Horizon technology to render that app, throw an icon in the dock, try to make it look as native as possible so that you don't have to have a, a full virtual machine or have a, a secondary PC device lying around. Um, that's something you know, that you can do to achieve that. And then lastly, for the, uh, the native apps, the first thing we wanted to focus on with this first version of the catalog was showing the download and install progress. Before, in our old implementation, we had a, a web clip that was just a web view. You click install, pray that it comes down, and uh, you know, go from there. So now we have these download and install progress in, in this tray right here. And so that's something that's been uh, really successful for us. Um, so closing with that, I wanted to talk about VMware code again. Um, this, is, this is something new that we've been working on. It's our new developer central portal 
It's the idea for this is it's going to be a community for, is my video playing? It's going to be a community for, um, <laughs> I don't know the secret to get these things to start playing. There we go. Didn't get that last time. Um, this would be our community resource portal for any kind of API scripts you have. There we go. Um, you know, detailed technical technical documentation, et cetera. Um, so this is where we want um, you know a lot of the integrations to live um, in this central source. And it's important to have these kind of resources, um, whether you use AirWatch or uh, other vendors, because um, you know no solution can do everything yet, right? You know, um, a lot of you guys have, have created some really cool tools and, and scripts that can extend what management tools can currently provide. And it's important to have a community to share with others to make sure that we're all creating you know, the best solutions possible. Um, so this is something where we have um, you know, some Mac OS uh, API scripts, um, custom attributes for gathering you know, arbitrary values from the device. Um, like I said, the bootstrap package documentation is in here. Um, so this is something that we want to encourage people to check out uh, to start looking for you know, kind of more technical documentation and resources that maybe not, are not in our uh, standard documentation. Um, so you know, this is kind of a short session. I really wanted to open up for as many questions as possible because I know we're, we're kind of um, newer, at least in, in this conference. Um, so that's all I had for now. Um, I want to open up the floor for any questions you have. So I'm just going to go over again because I haven't transferred my, my stuff to DEP yet or, I, or an MDM. So from, from my understanding, I've been talking to the guys and they said that said they're running um, AirWatch to deploy the uh, monkey packages. It's, mm -hmm. it's been difficult. I don't know if, if this is something new that you are presenting here, maybe that they, they didn't have before. Anything um, in particular? Uh, they just said it was, uh, it was difficult to set up the deployment of the initial, like the bootstrap monkey uh, files. So bootstrap is one thing and then monkey is the other. Bootstrap is using the native MDM command to deliver a package, d a signed distribution package on enrollment, and then monkey would handle you know, the rest of your apps. Yeah, no, I know that. So, but your NDM, which is the AirWatch, right, mm -hmm. is the one that deploys those, those the right. package, right? So I guess setting up that deployment to the system apparently was difficult. Mm. I, I know you're showing right now that it's integrated. So, but it's limited, right? I mean, for a, for a lab deployment, that doesn't really work for us because you, you it's, it's self-serve, but for us, we will actually like it to be automatically installed. Um, are we forced to use the monkey that you guys are providing, or can no. we like just use whatever? whatever yeah, we, we have you know our legacy flows. We have something called product provisioning that allows you to set up um, something we call file actions. So you have all the files you want to distribute to the device, and then you have a manifest of actions that you can reorder depending on what you want to do. So that was what people used um, before the monkey integration. It's really flexible. Um, it's it's. It's gotten a lot of flack really because the, the UX of the console setup is a little difficult. Mm -hmm. But once you get into it, it's a really powerful system that allows you to okay. you know, order the operations of, of what needs to happen on the device. Okay. Um, so that is another option if, if you don't want to use the monkey side. OK. So basically, you're replacing what the Plus Studio used to do, which was deploy the uh, monkey struct files, and then monkey will take over it. Right. Faster. Yeah, the okay. main point is. Um, and we didn't want to reinvent the wheel. Monkey's been around for a decade. It, it covers so many of the nuances, so many of the different corner cases and edge cases of these vendor packages. Some of them are built really well, and then some of them are not built so well. They have post-install scripts that are doing weird things. And so Monkey has been a tool that's been able to handle those natively. And so that was what, what we wanted to do, is bring in the power of Monkey, you know, have that kind of central engine for app deployment, mm -hmm. and then go from there. Yeah. So right now, you're not really there for us, I guess. But uh, like, I mean, if I can not be forced to use that, then I guess. Yeah, there's so definitely other options. Okay, perfect. Thanks. Hello. Hi. Glad you made it. Thank you. <laughs> this looks really interesting, and certainly the integration with Monkey is a good thing. I've been trying to wrap my head around the changes that Apple is bringing in terms of those third-party things that we have come to rely upon, and there's been fear and trepidation about mm. anybody that uses a launch agent, launch daemon, will no longer function. How does Monkey survive through that, through your envelope, if that's a, a word? 
To be honest with you, I think there's a little bit of FUD with Probably, the, with, yes. with uh, agents I'm, dying. I'd and, be glad for you to clear it yeah, up for me. I don't, I don't see that happening anytime soon. Um, there's just not enough tools in the U.S. to replace launch agents and launch demons yet. Um, you know, with, with Office, we've heard at WWDC that Office is coming to the App Store. I think that's definitely going to start, you know, a, a trickle-down effect of, you know, other app vendors starting to, you know, look at how they can build their apps for the App Store. Uh, with the current sandboxing limitations, it's going to be difficult. So I'm expecting Apple to continue to, you know, improve, you know, especially enterprise app distribution to give these apps the same flexibility that they currently have, um, but from the App Store. Um, so I, I see you know, at least for the foreseeable next few years, this, this is, this is the, the way it's going to be. Um, and then hopefully over time, the golden path will be VPP as, you know, more and more extensions for apps come out. Thank you. Um, I know you're probably not focused on Horizon. You mentioned it just briefly. Can you run native apps in Horizon? Native apps. Can you like, give me an example? So you showed it the example of running Visio, mm. a PC app on Mac. Um, I may be thinking way outside of the box here, but could you run Mac apps remotely, basically, or you know, a, a gotcha. virtualization through Horizon? No, no. It's it's for uh, Windows apps, and you know, I think some Linux-based apps can be also done on it. But okay. yeah, Mac apps need to be running on a Mac. One of your slides briefly showed um, App Store apps. C can you talk more about how AirWatch handles that? Yeah, so by App Store maps, I'm talking about VPP in particular. Um, I know for iOS, there is a, a way to do um, apps from the App Store without using VPP, uh, but that's something that's not possible from a Mac side of things. So right now, that, that concerns just the VPP side. So like I was saying with them, you know, I'm, I'm excited to see how VPP continues to grow, because right now there's, I think, OneDrive and a few other apps are, are the only ones that are currently being deployed through VPP. Um, but you know, as, as you know, the app story begins to evolve, I'm hoping that more and more will be those native apps coming from the app store. So it's a, from the um, AirWatch side, it's a, a similar mechanism of getting a, a VPP token. Mm -hmm. and yeah, and it uses all the MDM hooks to push that application down. Okay. Actually, the install application command that Bootstrap package uses it's the same command for VPP, just has different parameters in the command itself. Okay. So hopefully, did this uh, clear up a little bit on you know what we're doing here with AirWatch, you know our monkey integration, um, you know how we have MDM in our core going forward. Any other questions around that? Get extra time back. Thanks, everybody. <laughs>